In this video, we're gonna explore some interrogations where cops realized that they were finished. Let's get straight into the cases. We kick things off with Oklahoma police detective Michael Neely, who was found by security staff at a hotel sitting on top of another man's lifeless body. That man was Michael's chief of police, Lucky Miller, with whom Michael had attended a law enforcement conference in Florida. Prior to witnessing a horrific scene, the staff at the hotel received multiple noise complaints. In the interrogation room, Michael was quickly joined by two detectives who started questioning him in order to determine what exactly went down at the hotel room. And then from there, uh, we uh, got to the hotel and said, you got to the hotel? Did you guys make any stops anywhere? Or? Nope. Officer Neely was strangely calm during the whole process, almost to the point where it looked like he was bored. First, he answered a couple of basic questions about their trip and the arrival at the hotel. Tell me, Mike, you guys um, flew out of Tulsa? From Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, okay. And to Pensacola? Yep. Was it a direct flight? Nope. Right. Where'd you guys Houston. stop? <laughs> once they arrived at the hotel, the two men started drinking and watching football together. And tell me once, what, what you guys did once you got back to the hotel? That's about it. Just watch football game. Any particular team? Or just football in general? That was a Dallas game. Starting Dallas and somebody else All right. By the time they arrived at the room, they were heavily intoxicated. This could explain why Officer Neely couldn't remember any hotel staff coming in. Coming up and telling you guys to keep it down? I don't. I don't remember that. When asked what was the last thing he remembered, he answered with a question. So what is the last thing you remember as far as that evening up until the football game? I mean, I, I know you're asking me questions, but can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Okay. Side, who, 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 who is that? Since those were homicide detectives, Officer Neely asked what this interrogation was about. After quite a bit of silence, they revealed that he had been charged with second-degree murder, to which he just calmly replied that he had no idea what he was being charged with. Uh, advise what he was charged with? No, um, Michael, you being charged with second-degree murder. Okay. I had no idea what I was being charged with. They confirmed his charges, told him that they booked him into a jail, and that they already notified his wife. You're fixing to be booked in the Scammy County Jail with no bond, and we've already notified your uh, your wife. He then asked the detectives to tell him what happened, as he couldn't remember. You know, in return, so I, I would love to know what happened to. He also told them that he was shocked that the police chief was dead. I'm shocked. This. Dead. I mean, it's, 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 it's shocking. The detectives continued with the interview by asking him what was the last thing he remembered. He confirmed that he remembered watching football and drinking. You figure out what's the last thing you remember. Mm -hmm. And if you, the last thing you remember was watching football, uh, do you remember drinking? Yep. Okay. One of the detectives told him that the hotel guest from the room next door first heard them laughing and yelling. They got asked to keep it down by the staff, and they did what they were asked, but only for a short time. It wasn't long until they continued to be loud, which is why the guest had to transfer. This one was from the other neighbor because the one beside you, the first complainant, uh, they moved his room because you guys were continuing just to be loud. A member of the hotel staff was knocking on their door, but no one was answering, and all he heard was grunting and grumbling, so he used his card to get in. Once he came inside the room, he was horrified to see Officer Neely sitting on top of his chief's lifeless body. The staff member got him off, and Officer Neely just passed out on his bed. The detective also told Michael and another guest heard someone say, Mike, stop. When Officer Neely heard that, his face remained pretty much expressionless, and you can just tell that he didn't show any remorse even after learning everything that had just happened. He didn't show any sympathy for his chief and his family, nor did he ask for a lawyer. After the detective confirmed once again that his chief was no longer alive, Officer Neely just cleared his throat while still being pretty calm about it. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir, he's dead. Hmm. <clears throat> the detective then told him that his chief was found between his bed and the wall and that his eye was pretty much swollen shut. He was found dead between the uh, his bed and the wall. And his face was... Uh, his right eye was pretty much swollen shot. 
When he heard that, Officer Neely just sat there in silence with an unbothered expression on his face. It's hard to imagine someone having this kind of reaction or the lack thereof, and yet here we are. When asked if that helped him remember something, Officer Neely said that it didn't and added that he didn't have any kind of animosity towards his chief, nor did he have any kind of violent outburst when he was drinking before. Have you ever had uh, a violent outburst or anything like that before when you were drinking? No. Anybody ever told you that you got violent when you drank? No. For a while, Michael just kept saying how it was unbelievable. Well, at least we saw some kind of reaction for the first time. Yeah, that's, I can't believe it. He also wanted to know what his chief died from as his hands didn't feel anything, to which they replied that he was beaten to death. I mean, I, I'm feeling my hands. I, I mean, I, my hands don't feel anything, uh, you know. They revealed that his head was swollen, his eyes were completely shut, and that bruises were starting to show off by the time they got a search warrant. Officer Neely still couldn't think anything that might have triggered him to attack his chief like that. I mean, you, you can't think of anything that, that would have triggered you to, to jump on? Nothing. I mean, it's nothing. After a while, Officer Neely revealed that his chief wanted to go out to a bar, and he insisted on that, but he wasn't the one who didn't want to go out of the room. However, he didn't remember that being the reason for his anger. He kept wanting to go out. Let's go to the bar. When you go to the bar, I said, that's a bad idea. We shouldn't, you know, let's not do that. I don't, I, I mean, I wasn't pissed off at him, for God's sake. Eventually, Michael was sentenced to life in prison for taking the life of police chief Lucky Miller. Speaking at the sentencing, Lucky's sister couldn't understand how anyone could do such a horrible thing, especially knowing that Officer Neely was like a brother to him. When asked if he had any more questions, Officer Neely said that he didn't and that he was going to be booked into jail. They also asked him if he was going to harm himself and he said no. In the end, they asked him about his medical conditions and he was escorted out of the interrogation room. Next up, we have the interrogation of an ex-Newburyport police sergeant named Stephen Chason who, back in September 2013, was accused of committing lewd acts in public by a woman who was unlucky enough to witness such acts. He was performing these acts while watching her when she was at the ATM. Luckily, she was able to identify his truck and even managed to get a partial license plate number. When she went to the police station to report the incident, she saw the same truck parked outside. He was initially allowed to continue his duty, and it wasn't until six weeks after the incident that the following interrogation took place. The two detectives present in the interrogation room let him know that the interview was being recorded. First of all, this is recorded. Yeah. Then he went on to sign his Miranda rights. He also confirmed that he knew why he was being interviewed. When asked if he looked into the case file himself, he admitted to doing so a couple of times just to see if there were any updates. So you know the incident we're talking about? We're talking about the Wallace Room yeah. incident. Okay. Have you ever gone on the IMC computer and pulled up that incident itself? I have. How many times have you done that? Two to three times. What? Just to check on it, see if there's any more updates or whatnot. Since he knew the procedures, he probably did that in order to better prepare for his possible interrogation. They went on to ask him seemingly bizarre questions, such as when was the last time he got a haircut or if he chewed tobacco. Where do you get your haircut? Monthly. And where do you go? I go to Salisbury Square, but the last time I went to the place next to Panera. Um, do you chew tobacco? On occasion. They also asked him if he was at the police station on that particular date, and he confirmed that he was. The 17th, which is the date that we've all been talking about. Yeah. Were you at the police station that morning? I was. He also told them his exact whereabouts from that day. Then he admitted to changing the plates on his truck just days after the woman identified his truck that was parked on a police parking lot. Unsurprisingly, this made him look very guilty. It seemed as though he was trying to get rid of the evidence. You operate the truck, the Ross Collins truck? I, yeah, that is my vehicle. And it's got the, or it had the registration 359 BPH. Paul, Paul Henry? Yes. Chasen then confirmed that he didn't have any interaction with the woman who filed a report and then denied performing lewd acts. The well, lady, oh, you've read in the reports then who the person the right. victim is. Do you know this person? Never. Have you ever met her? No. Any interaction with her? Not that I know of, no. The detectives then asked him to explain why his truck was seen in the security camera footage, to which he replied that there was another similar truck in the area. And can you explain why a vehicle similar to yours shows up on the ATM cameras? No. It was probably the vehicle that was there. 
You know, it's, uh, you know, if there was somebody there in a vehicle like mine, it could have been that vehicle. He realized how bad it all looked at this point, but he still stuck to his story and didn't want to confess to anything despite one of the detectives telling him that it was only going to get worse from that point. He then went on to show them some text messages and pictures on his phone, hoping that it was going to back up his story. I'm not sure what time you text me. I think it was around 11. Um, I don't remember. And, you know, I still have him in my phone if you want to see him right now. Yeah, whatever you got that's... After he was done with that, he told them that they could have his cell phone records and tower information despite the fact that the latter would place him right at the crime scene. He was probably hoping the detectives wouldn't verify the data. Then he told them the approximate time he got home. You can have my cell phone records, you know, get tower information. He also told them that he first went to a boat club and then straight home and that he didn't stop anywhere. The boat club, you're there for how long? Five, ten minutes. Just went down, make sure the boat was floating. And from the boat club, you go right home. Straight home. He then claimed that he was on a walk with his wife when his colleague notified him that the woman accused him of performing lewd acts while she was at the ATM. I left my house with my wife for a walk at 1230. Yeah, 1230. It was right after I was done texting you. Then you could see him going through his phone, searching for call logs that would confirm his story. The detective then went back to the report and said that the woman described the man that matched his description. And Chasen was pretty defensive about it, telling him that he never had curly hair. I don't think well, the haircut does. I've never had curly hair, so... Well. After answering some questions about chewing tobacco, he asked if the woman could do a lineup. But the detective went back to circumstantial evidence and asked why he never told him that he changed his license plates. You got the plate on this? Got the plate of one. Um, anything close to your plate? No. He also wanted to know why Chasen would look up the case file so often. The detective also let Chasen know that he got overwhelming circumstantial evidence at that point and asked him to think of anything that could help him. Chasen then told the detective that he was willing to do a polygraph test. You're willing to take a polygraph? Yes. Okay, so if I sell it up to say police, you have no problem coming in no. taking he also wanted to see the photos of the truck in question so he could prove it wasn't his. I'd really like to see the reports or the photos or, you know, if I could see the photo, maybe we can prove it's not mine. When the detective told him that he was going to place him on leave, Chasen begged him not to do that as he was living paycheck to paycheck. He also told him that he wasn't going to interfere with the investigation, but the detective told him that he couldn't help him. I'm begging you, please don't do this to me. Steve, I've talked to Go everybody. through the investigation. I'm not going to interfere with the investigation. I've been here for six weeks. I understand that. Well, some of this information has just come to us very recently, like since Friday. Chasen was desperate at this point, and he proclaimed that it was the worst day of his life. They went on and on about what should be done next, and Chasen said that he was going to get a lawyer. Eventually, he was allowed to resign, and he wasn't charged with anything. Good old boys looking out for each other.